Hey there, my discipleship friends. Thank you for joining me as we continue to study God's Word together. The passage we're looking at today is Colossians chapter 2, verse 4. Paul says this, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. So using the here method, we highlight the passage, we name the passage that we want, and then we also put a title on there to help us summarize what we have learned. So I call this Sweet Smelling Venom. You know, this idea that there are things that, on the surface, they seem pleasing, they seem desirable, but it's actually deadly. And we see this with the, the teachings that, that we uh, sometimes have to deal with in, in the world. So explaining, this is talking about it in its original context. It was originally written to the church in Colossae where Paul had never visited, um, but he knew that they were dealing with the problems of false teachers, giving them a mix of Greek philosophy and Judaism. How does this passage fit into verses before and after? Paul wants them to have a full understanding of who Jesus is because a false understanding leads to a false faith. And Paul wants them to have that full understanding so they can protect themselves because Paul cannot be there to protect them from the false teachers. So why does the Holy Spirit include this passage in the book? Well, because he understands it's our human nature to accept what we'd like to hear rather than what we need to hear. That's, that's our human nature that we need to wrestle with. So applying this to our lives today, there are people who are teaching ideas in the church today that are a form of false gospel. And there are a lot of different examples that, that we can point to. won't unpack all of them, but we'll talk about one of them in a bit. But how is this passage helpful for me? Why is it an encouragement? Well, because when I'm aware of threats, I can prepare for threats. You know, I don't always know what's going to come around the corner, but, <clears throat> but if I know that there is constantly a danger that something that sounds good, that sounds friendly, can be creeping into what we read or what we hear, um, then I know to, to look below the surface to see, does this idea really hold up to it? And so we need to do this with, you know, that we need to do this with, with our own pastors. When you listen to me, you need to think, you know, the language that I'm saying, am I just telling you what you want to hear? You know, that's, uh, maybe that's a good thing. If you don't always like what your preacher has to say, that, that can be a sign that there's a problem with them, but it could also be a sign that they're doing their job right because, you know, if we are communicating scripture, it does not always tell us what we want to hear, but what we need to hear. But, you know, maybe our pastor is telling us something that sounds plausible on the surface, but deeper down, it's a problem. Maybe it's the Christian books we listen to, the blogs we we hear. Um, you know, it's there's, there's a lot of resources on, on radio, television, whatever it be, um, that call themselves Christians, but does it hold up? Is it merely plausible, or is it authentic? So what would this application of this verse look like in my life? Well, it's trying to look out for those, those things in my life that I want to hear. Am, am I aware of, of the stuff that, that, you know, that, that's naturally pleasing to, to me? as opposed to the things that prevent me from listening to what I want to hear. And, you know, an application of that could, could look like, you know, I'm, I'm all about, you know, studying information. I'm about the, about the details, getting the, the I's dotted, T's crossed when it comes to our, our doctrine. But, um, you know, how, how do we do when it comes to actually getting out and doing the work of the church? You know, as Reformed people, we love to talk, but... Are we quick to act? You know, maybe that's that's a, a blind spot. That because I'm so focused on on what is easy for me that I ignore what's difficult. Or uh, another way to for us to 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 respond to this is is by identifying those those false gospels. And so this is where I thought would be a, a helpful type of of application or or a response for this is um, looking at, at uh, there's, a, there's a great article here um, by Adam Ford, or Adam Ford is his name, and this came out a good number of years ago, but I still go back to it because it's such a useful resource. But he's unpacking moralistic therapeutic deism. 
And if you've been hanging around me for a while, you hear me use this really clunky language and I usually don't unpack it completely, but this is, this is my favorite summary of what moralistic therapeutic deism is. And I'm just gonna read it mostly word for word. And this is coming from Adam Ford. He says, I did not grow up in a Christian family. My whole life changed when I was converted about 10 years ago. Every day became a new adventure as I saw everything and everyone through the new lens I was wearing. As I studied and learned more and more, many things surprised me, but perhaps nothing caught me more off guard than a strange phenomenon I observed among church folks. At the time, I didn't know what to call it, but since then, a couple of researchers have identified and named it. Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. And they're like, what in the world is that, you ask? It happens to be a preferred religion of Western culture, which usually, and tragically, goes by the name of Christianity. So sociologists Christ, uh, Christian Smith and Melinda Lundquist Denton published a book in 2005 to summarize the findings of the National Study of Youth and Religion Research Project, for which thousands of teenagers were interviewed regarding their religious beliefs. The crazy results of the study were pretty similar to the confusing things I was noticing as an, an outsider coming into church culture for the first time while also studying the Bible and the historic faith. As the authors stated, a significant part of Christianity in the United States is actually only tenuously Christian in any sense, and that is seriously connected to the actual historical Christian tradition has rather substantially morphed into Christianity's misbegotten step-cousin, Christian moralistic therapeutic deism. So what is this MTD so many people believe in? Its beliefs can be summarized by the five points of moralistic therapeutic deism. So not the five points of Calvinism, a different five points. The first one is, a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on, on earth. And that in and of itself is not a bad statement, but it's too broad. It's too vague. It does not give us the necessary information. The second point is that God wants people to be good, nice, and fair with each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. So, you know, we see this idea that Christianity, they're really not that much different than other religions. The third point, the central goal of life is to be happy and feel good about oneself. Uh, it's an inward focus. It is about me. It's not about us looking at the preeminent Christ that we talked about yesterday. Uh, it's, you know, God is there for me. Fourth point, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. And that says, good people go to heaven when they die. Okay, well, what is a good person? Yeah, so there's there's problem with these these five points. You know, they're they're all disappointing. Why is it called moralistic therapeutic deism? Well, it's moralistic because it believes that we should be good moral people, not born again followers of Jesus. You know, just good people. That's the goal. Just good. Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? I want to be one of the good guys. Therapeutic because the goal of this religion is to provide therapeutic benefits to adherents. It's not to worship, adore, and obey the living God. God wants us to feel good about ourselves and have high self-esteem. I go to church because it makes me feel good. When the pastor keeps talking about sin, I don't feel good. Why, why are we doing this here? And then deism, God exists and created the world, but then kind of just leaves us alone unless we need him to fix a problem or provide us with something. And so you know, he explains you know, this problem a little bit more. He says, this is the religion of many people who call themselves Christians. The God of this religion is passionately focused on serving us while making us feel really good about ourselves. He'll mind his own business until we need something, and then he will spring into action. It's not about him. He requires nothing of us. It's all about us. He is at our beck and call. He's like a toady butler or a fawning genie. Put those two guys together and you get the god of moralistic therapeutic deism. Hello there, you rang. How can I make you feel better right now? Or how can I serve you? Wow, you're looking nice today. 
You're just the greatest thing, aren't you? Man, I am lucky to be your God. This is the God of many people who call themselves Christians. So why is all of this so tragic? Because MTD is not Christianity. It's not even a version of Christianity. Moralistic therapeutic deism is a false religion created by and for members of the most rich, catered, defensive, politically correct, overprotected, overnurtured, overfed society the world has ever known. And the fact that we use the name Jesus and various select Christian buzzwords allows it to be passed off as Christianity. It has nothing to do with biblical Christianity. It is not in the Bible. Jesus didn't teach it. Paul wouldn't recognize it. And yet it calls itself Christianity and is taught every Sunday by pastors in church buildings all over the place. The First Church of Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. We will tell you anything if you will just come back. Uh, oh, please, we have to pay. We have bills to pay, an institution to perpetuate. Don't be afraid to come and see how easy faith can be. Western society is a perfect environment for these me centered teachings to flourish. Add to that parents, especially fathers, and churches who fail to teach the truth, especially the harder truths, to people entrusted to them. Dad, is hell really real? Um, you know, um, wow, son. You know, whatever your youth pastor says. You know, oh, oh, look, sports. <laughs> well, previous night at youth group. All right, guys, I hope you're ready because today we're going to be tackling very difficult questions. Who can fit the most marshmallows in their mouth? Which, you know, I'm not opposed to that game, but that game itself does not help us answer the deep questions of life. Well, but when we get, you know, when we've got adults, pass, you know, parents, who are not willing or ready or able to teach kids because we pass it off to the, the professional youth teachers and the professional youth teachers don't know how to answer it because they're expecting the parents to do so, what do you do? And now we've got an epidemic and that's where we are right now, in the middle of an MTD epidemic. Be honest with yourself. How many people do you know who check Christian yet live as practical, moralistic, therapeutic deists? Who think that God wants them to have everything they want? Who minimize and justify sin? Maybe not the sins of others, but you know the ones they like, for sure. So, who clearly do... Who who clearly do not live biblically, but would offer a quick judge not where were someone to question them about that fact. Who can't explain even when the most basic biblical theology so many saints have died for in the history of their faith. Who, who think that the extent of following Jesus is to say a prayer one time, inviting him into their heart? Who only call on God when they have a problem or need something? Who assume that because their parents are Christians or because they grew up in the Bible Belt or because they pray before meals or attend a church service every now and then that somehow these things make them Christians no matter how else they live or what else they believe? Be honest with yourself. How many people do you know who subscribe to this fake watered-down imposter of a religion? Be honest with yourself. Do you? Woo! <laughs> That's... Uh... Uh, that is a very pointed argument that's right there. But is this what we need to hear? Again, we're talking about this idea of there's a difference between what we want to hear and what we need to hear. And, and one of the great big prayers is that we reach a point where what we need to hear becomes what we want to hear. But that will not happen if we are not humbling ourselves before Jesus Christ. That our wills would be transformed to his good, perfect, and pleasing will. So, yeah. Let's be people who are looking out for that sweet-smelling venom. And let's be careful of the message that comes from other people. And let's be introspective as well to see what is it that we believe and what's going on in our own hearts. Because trust me, the true Jesus Christ, the true gospel message, is far more pleasing. But we're going to have to humble ourselves first before we see the fullness of its fruit. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we do acknowledge that 
We are sinful people, all of us. Even, even if we've been going to church our whole lives, we are tempted and prone to sin. But thank you so much for Jesus Christ that he would come into this world and die on the cross to free us from the penalty of our own sins, that we would be regarded as righteous, that we would, by the Holy Spirit, become more and more a righteous people as you are. So, Father, reveal to us the false beliefs that are inside us so that we would be people who teach rightly the truth of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, my friends. Have a wonderful day.